Uh, Dr. Miller, I'd like to ask how your international work has altered your own practice here in the United States. Well, in fact, it has very much. And my most recent book, by the way, I, I did an even more international travel, which was to go to farms around the U.S. and learn from uh, family farmers. And that, in some ways, proved to be even more cross-cultural than going to these other places. But um, it has very much. And that my patients come from everywhere. And it turns out that um, getting people to change their lifestyles or to think about their health in a new way by giving them positive options rather than telling them what to avoid um, is a very effective way to practice medicine. It's a very effective way for all of us to make changes in our life. So really by bringing stories back and recipes and examples from all these places and trying to find something that resonates with them. And it doesn't have to be on a genetic or ethnic level. It can just be stories that... Um, so, it, uh, yeah, everything that I've mentioned are things that make their way into my clinical practice, including the fact that for children who have a strong family history of asthma and allergies, I'm prescribing sustainable farm time, and certainly for pregnant women who've already given birth to one child who's on inhalers and so on, I tell her to go spend some time on a healthy farm. Hi. Um, so we've heard a bunch today about uh, having basically bacteria and, and having soil uh, bacteria in your gut and the microbiome. And uh, we've also talked about um, dental caries being an infectious disease. And so I, I as a, I guess it's a more clinical than public health question, but as a parent of an infant, I've gotten conflicting advice about um, sharing spoons or you know, pre-chewing your kid's food, which is a traditional eating practice that I've seen. So I'm wondering if there's a general consensus on that thought. <laughs> well, um, I'm, I'm not a dentist, that's, uh, uh, but uh, it's not recommended to pre-chew your food for your baby. Not only can you pass the bacteria that causes tooth decay, but you can pass other bacteria, viruses. Uh, herpes virus actually is quite commonly passed from parents to children, so I wouldn't recommend pre-chewing the food for your baby. You're going to get the, the family doctor's perspective <laughs> here. There's actually a lot of research showing that uh, children who are, grew up in families where everything is shared, including a common family spoon, have much lower rates of A to P. Um, they get common colds much more often in the first year of life, but in fact, that seems to be protective long term um, in, in terms of asthma and allergy as well. There's some really interesting research coming out from pre-contact tribes, and it's actually a researcher in El Salvador I should hook you up with, who is studying the microbiome of malls of these communities and finding that, in fact, just like I showed you for those children in Bulpan, that the bacterial makeup of the microbiome of their mouth, which is, in fact, part of their gastrointestinal tract, is totally different than children who are living in modern culture. So what's the chicken or the egg? Is it the sodas that are changing the microbiome or is something happening that's very formative in utero and that we're all, as I said, subject to with this loss of biodiversity that's making us all more at risk for these diseases? And yes, the junk food we're eating is a big problem. I don't mean to, to, to minimize that at all, but we might be uh, a little too distracted by that when there's a lot of other things going on. And uh, certainly getting back to where our food is grown and how it's grown and how much of our soil we are connected to in our community is a, is a huge piece of this. Karen, I think you should give your mother's advice at this point. <laughs> <laughs> Always listen to your mother. Uh, my, my mother told me when uh, my first child was an infant and he really loved playing outdoors in the dirt and he, he was just crawling around and often his hands would go from the dirt to his mouth and she said, don't worry, a child has to eat a pound of dirt by his first birthday, that's healthy. So somewhere, <laughs> somewhere that, that is common lore, I don't know whether you've heard I, it, but that's I, what my mother I totally said. Yeah. So it, it, of course it could be healthy. It's complicated because the pound of dirt that you're going to get in a place like Bayview Hunters Point is going to be filled with lead and so on. And yes. so this is a very, uh, you know, this is a very complicated uh, story, and I don't mean to simplify it at all, but I do feel like we need to explode the conversation more and uh, not just get distracted by the red cape, which is a very distracting red cape, all that, all that junk food. 
this is a question for Karen, um, or both of you. Uh, and I recognize that your presentation was on child health and you're not a dentist, but I've seen a lot more information in the media about dental health being related to heart disease and being related to Alzheimer's or having bacteria so close to your brain. Um, I'm just curious if you can speak to any of the longer term health impacts of dental caries. Yeah, there's a lot of research coming out about uh, more and more impact of poor oral health, not only in children, but, but also in adults. As you say, it's been associated with increased risk of cardiovascular disease. Uh, it also is associated with increased exacerbation of, of diseases of, of chronic inflammation like diabetes and asthma. Uh, and also in pregnant women who have periodontal disease, it's been associated with increased risk of preterm delivery and low birth weight. So those are just some of the diseases that's associated with in adults, let alone uh, the complications I discussed in children. So oral health is a big problem for our whole population. Yeah, and there are some intervention studies showing that if you fix the teeth, that other problems get better too. A lot of the inflammatory markers go down. So it's not just... Uh, you know, sort of true, true, and unrelated. There really is, uh, you know, a reversible effect too. So, I had more a comment on this two last question. Then, uh, well, uh, concerning uh, inflammatory response, you know, it has been shown that toxic stress also increases in inflammatory response, and that um, independently increase uh, adulthood chronic diseases. So definitely having a chronic inflammatory response is bad. <laughs> um, and then concerning the, you know, giving your spoon to your baby, I don't know about the microbiome in the mouth, but if we see what Dr. Menery has shown before is that the uh, microbiome until age three is different from your microbiome in adults. So you might not want to you know, give, there might be a, a reason why the microbiome at that age is different. And so, as, as uh, you know, as you said, it's important probably not to give, uh, share your spoon with your baby. The, we've had a lot of conversation about sort of what the ideal microbiome looks like. The truth is that nobody knows, and that uh, you know, even that the fact that we're trying to develop, you know, probiotics to sort of develop, you know, to to create an ideal microbiome, I think is at this point way too premature because. We're still trying to understand there might be really small players in the gut that you haven't even identified who actually are huge levers on our health. It might be that all of those bacteroidetes that we're looking at and thinking are so healthy, do you know they could be place markers for all we know. And so I think that this, we're just at the very beginning of a huge, as, as we heard earlier, a huge discovery. And, uh, but what we do know is that this idea of, of um, uh, families who live in an intimate way and sort of share spoons and so on, looking at certain outcomes, they really are healthier. So that, that's all that I was, um, I was offering. I wasn't even necessarily saying the microbiome was the way that that happened. So. Yeah. Actually, I, I would love to comment on the issue of chronic stress uh, because this is something that I've been worried about in the children that we see. What is the impact? on children when they're suffering from pain from the youngest of age and it goes on and on and on for years and years and as much as they cry and complain to their parents nothing is done about it. Uh, I'm really worried about how revved up the whole chronic stress uh, the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis is and what effect that has on the child's physical health and then what's the effect on the child's mental health that nobody's able to help relieve the pain. I really worry about that. And you know, when we see child soldiers that are easily recruited out there, I wonder, have they been suffering from pain? Uh, you know, what what is the impact on them? Well, and it isn't just pain; it's excruciating pain. Yes. I mean, dental pain yeah. really is awful. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. awful. Um, I was also curious how the tooth decay in children affects their teeth as adults. Like, is there any reversibility of the decay, and can they still develop normal adult teeth? Yeah, so again, I'm not a total expert on this, um, but in the best of all worlds, 
uh, the decayed teeth would uh, either be treated or fall out themselves or uh, be pulled out. And then when the permanent teeth came in, uh, the child would have a clean slate and the permanent teeth would come in and they'd be taken care of perfectly, you know, brush the teeth twice a day and healthy food, and then the child would be able to have uh, healthy permanent teeth. But that doesn't typically happen. So what happens is that there's a, many years of overlap while the children have the decayed baby teeth and the new permanent teeth are coming in. And so the permanent teeth start coming in around six years of age, uh, but all the decayed baby teeth are there too. And so what we see, within months, the brand new permanent molars are already infected with the decay. And then the baby teeth actually stay until 11 or 12 years of age, so they're in the mouth for a long time. And so the infection can spread. It's called rampant decay, can spread to the teeth. And again, if the child doesn't learn good hygiene practices and good nutrition practices, then the permanent teeth are going to be decayed too. It takes a little while uh, for the decay to set in because they're bigger, the enamel is, is uh, thicker and stronger, but they'll get decayed too. Hi, um, my question is for Dr. Miller. Thank you both, that was both very interesting. Um, the, you mentioned that there's some beneficial effect to pausing before we eat. Um, I'm not a religious person, but I try to get my family to take a breath before we <laughs> eat, um, which is a challenge. What is the, what's the effect, and how long yeah. do you have I, to pause? If I'd had more time, I would actually um, have an interesting series of slides on it. Well, it's really interesting. What happens is that at first what's released is ghrelin, which is you know, just sort of your appetite hormone. But then if you pause after um, you know, like 30 seconds to a minute, you actually start releasing leptin as well, which is the end book hormone, <laughs> which makes you stop eating. Um, and what happens is for people who do that, by the end of the meal, they've released a lot more leptin sooner. And so their satiety comes on, their appetite comes on a little faster, but their satiety comes on even more faster. Even more faster. Wow, I'm speaking some great English here. <laughs> um, and so what that does, some total, is translate into less food eaten overall. Um, it turns out that if you um, chew more, <laughs> that also does it. Uh, so contemplation and chewing, and my own extrapolation of that, and there has, is not data to support this, but is if you cook more, then that happens as well, right? Because that's a whole form of pre-contemplation, right? Mm -hmm. So I always say the three C's, cook, contemplate, and chew. And uh, those are just... <laughs> that's good. We have a question right here. Sounds um, like a cow, actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, hi, uh, this question is for both of you. You can answer however you think. Um, so there's like a big movement to ban fluoride from our products right now. And it may reduce decay, but is there anything that you found that is actually detrimental to a child's health through fluoride? And then my second question would be for Dr. Miller. Um, could you talk about the interventions that are working, like that include, you know, that, that traditional diet and like probably that are happening locally? And if there's any interest from institutions to kind of support them to be even bigger? I mean, because I, I come from a Mexican background and I've always known that my mom's uh, diet was pretty good, you know, and stereotypically they say no, that there's lard and stuff, but my, my mom didn't use lard, like she knew that that was really bad. You know, my dad really liked it, but that was him. You know, you couldn't do anything about it. And he got type 2 diabetes, but nobody else in the house <laughs> ate lard. So, and that was because she made this, like, obvious choice not to include it in our diet. But I'm just wondering, you know, what kind of efforts that are local, that, that are working and are, you know, kind of like sparking this movement. I'm going to tackle the fluoride. Okay. Um, I'll share what I know about fluoride. Actually, back in the old days, uh, we didn't need added fluoride because, you know, again, if you look at that slide that I showed on the Kerry's balance, there wasn't all that stuff, all the processed and sugary foods that were pushing towards Kerry, so we didn't need that extra fluoride to protect the teeth. Uh, just normal uh, 
regular hygiene was fine. Uh, but now that we have so much pushing towards the caries in our diet, uh, the kinds of foods, the frequency of snacking, uh, it, it's found that fluoride uh, supplements either in the water, in toothpaste we have, we have mouth rinses, uh, we're applying fluoride varnish for the children where they don't have fluoride in the water, so all of those things can be helpful. There have been hundreds of studies on this and, and uh, paper, review papers by, I think, uh, World Health Organization, Centers for Disease Control, American Dental Association have, have shown that in, within a, a safe range, fluoride is safe, uh, and they prescribe the ranges uh, you know, carefully and that you should make sure that it doesn't go outside. If you have too much fluoride, it can lead to fluorosis, which is just a staining modeling of the teeth. It's not a fatal problem, but it's more of a cosmetic problem. Yeah, my understanding is that when ingested in large amounts, it actually can compete for absorption of other micronutrients as well. Yeah. So there is that, you know, zinc is one that comes to mind. Marion, do you, do you remember? I, actually, I, iron and zinc come to mind, but someone needs to double check me on that. But there is, I didn't come in here armed with my fluoride data, but it's something that uh, I, I do recall. Um, but, you know, certainly the way that you're doing it, which is painting it on, it seems like it's a, it's, you know, in terms of a smart, low-cost, win-win intervention. It makes sense. Yeah, that's actually a lot safer. Applying it topically it gets right. absorbed locally, and a lot less is ingested right. and going to the rest of the body. So it's, it's absorbed where you need it. Right. Yeah. Um, in terms of your other great question, uh, where locally are these movements starting to take place? Um, I mentioned La Cocina. Are you, have, are, do you know about them in San Francisco? What that is is actually an incubator for indigenous food businesses. So women who are, you know, selling uh, um, things even on the street. But it really, they have a minimum standard there in terms of the types of resources they're using. So they're not, you know, just using tons of processed mazola oil, you know, to uh, um, make their empanadas or whatever they're doing. They really are much more using the traditional recipes. So I look at that as a, um, a recipe bank or a reservoir for ind ind indigenous cooking that's then giving recipes back. I find that in general, in terms of disseminating these things in the community, they have to come community member to community member. I was so struck by a study that was done not long ago in, I think it was in Pakistan with farmers, and what it was doing was trying to figure out what kind of teacher could get farmers, um, rural farmers to change their systems. And it turned out that if it was a teacher who was from another community even, even if it was Pakistani, it wasn't going to have the same impact in terms of changing ways as someone from that community. Or if they wore a watch that wasn't someone, someone from that community might wear. And that goes for me too. I sometimes realize that when I'm hearing things, you know, maybe if I'm hearing it from a community of physicians, I'll perk up my ears rightfully or wrongfully, then, you know, another community of teachers. So I do feel like these things have to come from our own community. And I really welcome ideas that you have for how to integrate that into healthcare and into all the policy stuff that we're talking about today. I'm not a policy person, so I need for you guys to do that work. I'm just giving you ideas. <laughs> I, I, um, I'm halfway through pharmacology and liking it a lot, but I, no offense, but what can an American possibly teach people in a, like a blue zone who live over 100 years? I mean, what do they expect you to teach them about nutrition? Um, I know. Believe me, I'm not offended. I was completely, I was, I was so struck by the irony of it that I could barely leave my, my front door in the morning while I was there. But hey, they, you know, they were paying my salary. Um, <laughs> So it turns out that most of the physicians who are working in that hospital, do any of you familiar with Chubu Hospital? It's like the Mass General or Brigham and Women's or, you know, it's just like the fanciest hospital in Japan, it turns out, for medical students to go to because they have so much pathology there. So all these medical students who are very desirable from the north come down to Okinawa to learn there. And what do they come down there with? They come down there with their, you know, you know, there's 24 ounces of soda and so on. So I would sit there in these lecture halls with these kids 
who were eating basically junk food. And all I would do, because their English was supposedly fluent, but was in fact barely proficient, is I would just go to the local markets during the day and take pictures of these hundred old people, year old people and what they were selling and eating. And then I'd show the slides to the medical students. And they were treating me like I was brilliant, you know, <laughs> like I was bringing them this information from, you know, from, from the, the hallowed halls of the, you know, they knew I went to Harvard for medical school. So they kept on telling everybody this was information from a Harvard doctor, when in fact all that I had done was walked around and uh, taken pictures from the markets there. So really what I served as is a mirror to their own culture, but um, that's what I did. That's actually totally been my experience, too. When, when we report on our results about how much junk food and soda and chips these kids are eating, people say, well, you have to teach the mothers good nutrition. And, and uh, we don't have to teach them good nutrition. Every day when we go out to the villages, the women get together, and they cook for us this incredible spread of their traditional foods. And when we look at the data, we also ask the mothers how often they're eating the junk food and drinking the soda. They're not eating the junk food and drinking the soda. They're just sticking by the traditional diet. For some reason, they've gotten convinced that they need to give their children this special modern food. Do you and think we, food marketing has exactly, anything to do with exactly. that? Exactly. So I think we need to just... Uh, do counter advertising and support the value in their traditional diets, which they already know how to cook. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, as a just a side note, did you guys see in that picture of me with the consult team? Did you see what I was holding in my hand? Spam. Yes, it was a can of spam. I just sort of left that there. That was in the counter in the nutrition room as an example for healthy eating. <laughs> Okay, that's something that they should be eating to avoid the metabolic syndrome. So, you know, wow. Well, yeah, I was just going to have a little link back to the microbiome. This is just a conversation I was having with Joe DeRisi, who is um, a scientist, uh, a very well-known scientist at UCSF. And, and we were just chatting, so I hope this I'm not, like, blowing his big story here. I probably am uh, with my big mouth. But it was just fascinating because, um, and also kind of falling into dentistry. But he is well-known for being a virus hunter and has a lot of really interesting stories in, um, in, of that ilk, but um, he is now working with a dentist in his lab, and they're doing deep sequencing on kids who have caries and kids who don't, and because they've looked at risk factors, and there's these, you know, these incredibly healthy brush 30 times a day, and they still have like a mouthful of it's caries, and it turns out when they look at the microbiome, there's like one bacterium which is highly represented, and it turns out it's actually, I can't remember if it was from a like probiotic or from a, a yogurt, I think it was a yogurt manufacturer, but it turns out that they had selected for this because it tastes good or something, but it's selected to secrete acid. And so it, like, sticks. And you can do anything you want, but it, A, it's sticky. It's, like, selected to be sticky, and it secretes acid. And, and I was like, they're so evil. And I don't know if it's that they were being evil. I think it was just that it was, like, making the product better, like Danone or, you know, something, whatever it was. And it just so happens that it's, it just completely takes over the mouth, and you can't get it off, and it secretes acid. So it was just like, yeah, so hopefully, I mean, this, this should, exactly should be out in nature soon, about, right? I hope. But you know, <laughs> don't tell anyone in the meantime, you know, <laughs> especially that I yeah, we, we have no, we are playing with fire Sorry, with Joe. stuff. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, it's fascinating. Yeah. One more here. Hi, Dr. Miller. Thank you so much for um, your talk. Um, I'm wondering about bringing um, this kind of information to medical students. I think of Dr. Weston Price's book, Physical and Nutritional Degeneration, and if that kind of textbook, I know they use it in some places in Europe in medical school, to be brought into our schools here, your kind of thought on traditional cultures and being exposed to um, soil and things like that. Is there any movement towards that, or is there just not enough Data to Such, I mean, first of all, Weston Price's book is an interesting example you give because, as you know, he was, uh, in fact, uh, um, also studying the dental health of uh, these cultures. And what was funny is he ended up in a lot of the areas that mm -hmm. I did, but 80 years earlier. Um, and, um, you know, his, his, his scientific conclusions are sometimes interesting, but for his time, he really... he uh, a very uh, polite uh, way um, of putting it. <laughs> um, for his time, he really, you know, was very, had just a huge amount of insight. Um, but getting to the more 
uh, important part of the question is how do we start to make shifts within medical education? I have to tell you that I've come kind of full circle on this and that I used to be, uh, I, obviously when I was in medical school I didn't see the utility of any of this because I didn't know about it because I was in a school where they didn't teach nutrition, not that they do that anywhere. Um, and then I became very adamant that it really should take up huge amounts of time within our medical education. And now I've kind of come back again to realizing that there's so much competition for, for kind of air time in medical school and it's a crazy in four years that you're supposed to expect to, to learn how to take care of just seriously, seriously ill uh, patients. And I feel like most of this, in fact, is the work for all of us. And that if doctors want to get interested, great, they can come into the tent. But we need to practice medicine way upstream from where most physicians ever set foot, which is really in thinking about how to change policy, how to change the way that we're feeding our children in our homes, what's happening when we educate children in our schools, the fact that we're still scratching our heads about how to teach children ecology and edible education when we know that this is a core part of being vital and healthy, how, how can we still be scratching our heads about that? You know, it's, let's just make it happen. So yeah, sure, let's change medical education, what the heck, but you know, <laughs> The doctors are one tiny part of this problem. They're, they're a good target, but I'd rather they know how to take out my appendix, okay? And, um, you know, and I'm a doctor, okay? But we just, this is something we all need to own and change. And doctors who want to come along for the ride, so be it. That's great. Just a, a comment on educators, and I think you both were, um, you know, uh, saying the same thing. But in the communities I work in, uh, grandmothers are an incredible resource. So we, we've kind of got some some different dietary habits going on with you know younger adults, and uh, uh, you know adults learn by by watching and doing. So this is a this is a uh, um, you know a modeling uh, activity. This is not a talking activity or a poster activity kind of thing. So people in the community that have um, better habits and the, the health to back it up, you know, the, the, the consumer, no matter how uneducated they are, is really pretty smart. Um, then those are the, the kind of people that can be effective teachers and not somebody from far away. Uh, I agree with that, too. And what we've seen, for example, in our El Salvador program, the community health workers were from the communities and they were models in their community and uh, we were lucky that all of the community health workers in our program who had children who were in the zero to six age range, their children were cavity free. And that is the biggest lesson to the other families in their community that this is possible and they can see it with their own eyes. Yeah. That's, that's very, very hopeful. Yeah. And I love hearing things like yeah. that. <laughs> um, we're at the end of our time and we don't want to do anything to keep people from having their coffee break. So please give Daphne and Karen a big hand.